This is the story of three men, a mayor, a minister, and a general. It's also the story of three cities, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Seattle, and their efforts to repair their ailing public schools. School reform has been in the national spotlight for more than 15 years. It's in the headlines again this year as elections draw near. These three stories of dedication and frustration tell us a lot about how easy it is to fail and how hard to succeed. The Marrow Report, Tale of Three Cities, The Mayor, The Minister, and The General, is brought to you by the people of Toyota. And by the Ford Foundation, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trusts, with additional funding by the Annenberg CPB Projects and the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Chicago, the city on the lake, is the home of the nation's third largest school district, with 589 schools and 431,000 students, mostly minority, mostly poor. In 1987, Chicago's dropout rate approached 33 percent. We've hit rock bottom. We can't go any lower. <laughs> so the lower you get, maybe it's, uh, that's what's happening. In Chicago, prior to 95, our schools were a national, local disgrace, but we admitted it. Because it wasn't just a matter that test scores were down. It was a physical condition of the schools at that time. Most of these kids in the Chicago public schools had to go to schools that were dilapidated. The mayor himself took control of the schools in 1995. Someone had to do something with it. The federal government couldn't take it. The state government didn't want to manage. Uh, they were not going to give it to the United Nations. But the leaders of an earlier reform effort were not about to step aside. Do not get fooled by this propaganda that a mayor alone is going to change your school system. Our second city is Seattle, a crown jewel of the Pacific Northwest. Seattle's school system is about one-tenth the size of Chicago's. Poverty was not as great a problem in Seattle. Only 40% of its students received free or reduced-price lunch. But middle-class parents were abandoning the public schools. And about 24% of the kids in this town choose not to go to the Seattle School District and we need to be serving them. Seattle's leaders were determined to look outside of education for a new superintendent. We don't need just a leader. We need a, a change agent. Um, we need someone who knows how to orchestrate, orchestrate change of a major institution. That's a rare breed of cat. Seattle found him in John Stanford, a retired major general. And we have to get the entire community excited about educating our children. The new superintendent would have a built-in advantage. The teachers' union was ready to embrace reform. The members of the union had pretty much gotten to the point where they, where they weren't very comfortable anymore here with the old adversarial stuff. Seattle welcomed John Stanford and grew to love him. Um, John had an amazing chemistry with Seattle um, that people who, who barely knew him or had never met him were touched by him. But three years later, tragedy struck. I miss John every day, because he still very much inhabits this space. This was his office. I'm sitting about where his desk was right now. Our third city is Philadelphia. It's a city of history and tradition, the home of Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell. It's also the home of a failing school district. With 216,000 students in 259 schools, it's the nation's fifth largest district, and along with Chicago, Philadelphia was one of the poorest. And frankly, the performance of the schools in Philadelphia has been somewhat horrible. When you see the need for um, policing the schools, surveillance cameras, when you see young people uh, carrying weapons, um, you, you must conclude dismal. In 1994, over half of all Philadelphia public school students failed statewide exams. About half graduated on time. 80% of Philadelphia's students live in poverty. We get kids coming in beaten, we get kids coming in hungry, we get kids coming in sick, sick, and the average teacher will tell you here that they spend more than 50% of their time as a social worker. Like Seattle, Philadelphia brought in an outsider, not a general, but a minister and a lawyer. 
David Hornbeck had never been a teacher or school principal, let alone a school superintendent. Hush. Hush. Someone is calling my name and yours and yours and yours throughout this land. Whereas Seattle had embraced the outgoing John Stanford, many in Philadelphia had difficulty warming up to David Hornbeck. Mayor Ed Rendell was Hornbeck's strongest supporter. He's just got that missionary zeal, uh, and it gives him sort of tunnel vision and, and great focus. Before long, Hornbeck had alienated Pennsylvania's governor. He has a tendency from time to time to suggest that he's the only one that has concern or compassion for those kids. In Seattle, John Stanford found a teacher's union that was eager to reform. That was not the case in Philadelphia. All those in favor of authorizing the executive board to conduct a strike, please rise as you give your answer to I. Would these three cities, under dramatically different leadership, be able to fix their ailing schools, not just improve test scores, but change the fundamental rules and prove that all children can learn? From the outside, it seems as if Mayor Richard Daley runs Chicago's public schools. The real story is quite different. Almost from the day the mayor tried to assume control in 1995, a bitter struggle has been raging between grassroots reformers and the mayor. Grassroots school reform began in 1988, when a new state law decreed that every public school in Chicago would be governed by a locally elected council. Please come out and vote. The elections generated considerable interest. More than 17,000 people ran for positions on school councils, including computer programmer Angela Hill. I know this is my responsibility to my child and to the other children of this community. I decided to run because I would like to know what's going on with my children within the school system. Now, they're giving us some type of power to local school council, so hopefully we can make a change. Voting mattered because local school councils would have significant powers, including the authority to hire and fire the principal. Angela Hill. This does put the power in the hands of the parents and the community and the teachers. And if it fails, there's nobody to blame but you guys. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm accepting that challenge. Councils soon held their first meetings, including Bird Academy, where Angela Hill had been elected. That responsibility for the chairperson of the council is an awesome one. Once hired by local school councils, school principals also had more power. They hired the teachers. We really opened up what was, what was previously a very parochial human resource system. It's much easier for committed, young, dedicated individuals to get a job in Chicago where before you didn't know how to do it. Now, you just have to knock on a principal's door and if that principal want to hire you, wants to hire you, you can get hired in the city of Chicago. James Hammonds, once a council member at his children's school, now heads the Chicago Association of Local School Councils. He says most councils have been effective. This whole attitude about education has changed. People were being coming to schools, leaving schools, dropping out in high rates, not caring. That has changed because the parents are involved in the schools, the teachers, the principals. We've got principals now who are motivated, who care about the students in their schools. And this has been a whole cultural change that has taken place. And you can't measure that by simply going to a test score. But seven years later, more than 70% of Chicago students were still failing basic skills tests in reading and math. The state legislature decided that grassroots reform had not accomplished enough. It passed new legislation, basically turning Chicago's public schools over to the mayor, Richard Daley. Well, most, part, most people thought I was lost my mind. Who would want to take over a public school system? Any mayor in the country would have lost their mind. It's a, it was falling into the mud. It was sinking rapidly. More companies were moving out. More people were moving out. It wasn't going anyplace. It was getting worse. The new legislation left local school councils intact, but it gave the mayor sweeping powers to reorganize the system. We didn't blame anybody. We didn't look back. We said this is a whole new day, and we're going to improve our schools each day, each week, and each month. 
The same legislation also took aim at Chicago's powerful teachers union, which was prohibited from striking for three years. I think you could call it union-busting legislation. Linda Lenz is editor of Catalyst, an independent so. magazine about school reform in Chicago. They can't bargain over much of anything besides compensation. They can't bargain over class size, layoff procedures, um, seniority to a large extent. In short, the mayor held all the cards, and he played them. Chicago put $2 billion into renovating and building schools and creating new education programs. Mayor Daley put Paul Vallis in charge of day-to-day -day operations. We believe that we have to take academic responsibility for the children uh, when they're born. So we have the largest after-school extended day in early childhood and summer school programs in the country. You can't argue with uh, union peace two years there are two four-year contracts in a row. You can't argue with close to two billion dollars going into new schools. You can't argue with increasing test scores. Test scores had improved. Chicago began to get a lot of attention. Just look at Chicago, which ended social promotion and made summer school mandatory for those who don't master the basics. Math and reading scores are up three years running with some of the biggest gains in some of the poorest neighborhoods. It will work, and we should do it. What was your reaction to President Clinton, Secretary Riley, saying, well, Chicago is a model for the nation? Well, I think they realize that uh, uh, there has to be some light at the end of a tunnel. A few months later, in late April, Chicago held its own celebration. On behalf of the Chicago Reform Board of Trustees and the Chicago Public Schools, welcome to the meeting of the challenges of education conference. The school district trumpeted its accomplishments. Chicago today is a powerful example of public education's potential. But behind the scenes, a fierce power struggle was raging between Daly's forces and the 1988 reformers, including James Hammonds. You know, we don't have to listen to Daly's propaganda. That's for the rest of the world to listen to. We have control over the schools. It's no secret that I'm no fan of school reform groups, okay? I, I think school reform groups have gotten away with highway robbery. Who deserved credit for the apparent progress? Were Mayor Daley and Paul Vallis building on the earlier work done by the grassroots reformers, or had they done it all by themselves? Well, a lot of changes were made in 95, so the 95 changes were very significant because it started all basically new in 95. The legislation in 1988 is the foundation for school reform. Yeah, but a foundation that sunk. <laughs> so when you have foundations sinking, we had phony budgets, we had mismanagement, corruption, waste, and fraud. I don't know what he means by it was sinking. The system was sinking before school reform. And it was school reform that resurrected Chicago's schools. So some schools were doing well, but overall the schools are not doing. Social promotions existed. More children were dropping out. And that just came to a brink in 95. This administration will do whatever it has to do to make certain that the media and people believe that it is doing a great job. Uh, and including lying. They fear our success because basically our success uh, in turn has dis discredited some of the things that they've tried to accomplish. We are making a difference in our schools day in and day out. But day in and day out have local school councils made a difference. In 1988 we attended a meeting of the local school council at South Loop Elementary School. This meeting tonight is to set up some bylaws and have an election. Arguments began almost immediately. Sheila Garrett, the chair, had accused white teachers of racism on a local radio program, and a teacher had played the tape for her second graders. You're already talking about your kids have poor self-images, so to tell those kids that these teachers hate them just because they live in Hilliard or just because they're black at best shows poor judgment. What did I, I, you say I said? I didn't say you said anything. I said you played it in your classroom. Played what? The radio show. You cannot be an informed citizen if you don't know what is going on. So what's wrong with having the children listen to a radio program? What's wrong with it? First of all, you knew the content of the program before Sheila I didn't went know, on. I because I, 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 I turned it on. Sure, because <laughs> Sheila doesn't do anything without d discussing it with you. Now you brought it up. Let's finish it. I Sheila doesn't do anything sorry, without discussing it with you. There would be Second. no more. I'm sorry, Michael. Second. Michael, I am sorry. There would be no more discussion on this. Eleven years later, in the spring of 1999, the South Loop Local School Council seemed to be fighting the same battles.
they don't want their kids here. They don't want the project kids or those little bad little black kids, as they say, going to school with their little white kids. We treat every child the same. And I, if somebody said about my child, that poor little white boy, I would be so insulted. And I'm ashamed that that's coming out of somebody's mouth on our council. I feel sorry for you because we are poor. And my little black, poor little, seven little black boys need an education. I just wish you would label your children as children, that's all. That's all I'm saying. Just give them that opportunity to be a child. My child is a poor little black kid. Council members fought throughout the evening over spending, over vacation time. They even argued over who had attended more meetings. There was no serious discussion of children or their education. If you didn't come, come to the meeting, then that's your problem. But if some local school councils seem to have lost sight of children, what about Mayor Daley and his team of 1995 reformers? They've stressed academic achievement particularly on standardized tests. We are reliant on tests in part because when we came in three years ago, you couldn't trust the grades. The importance of tests is obvious at Austin High School, which we visited in the spring of 1996. In 1995, more than 90 percent of the students at Austin failed a basic skills test called the Illinois Goals Assessment Program, or IGAP. And how much time are you spending getting ready for the IGAP? Every day. Every, we're, 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 you want to tell me about it? Everything we do is the IGAP. In what? every class, every subject, they teaching us about the IGAP. I use the IGAP coach, and my students uh, work from the IGAP coach each day, 25 minutes, in each area, subject area. They teach us, you know, what to do, how to do it, ask us questions, give us homework about the things that will be on the IGAP test. That's what we do in all our classes. All your classes? Um, yeah, all of them, including gym. Oh, come on. And music, and music too. There's a lot of pressure on us, on the kids, everywhere. What are the four things we look for in characterization? Um, Hurry up, come on, everybody. Everybody. For teachers like Reed Session, the emphasis on test taking means less time for real teaching and learning. We are good teachers at this school. It is unfair for us to be graded based on a test result, but we have to do it, and we're going to do it. Unfortunately, they did not do it. Test scores failed to rise, and Austin remained on probation. We decided to revisit Austin in 1999. You'll see a school that is far different than the one you may have visited uh, four years ago. He was wrong. Austin High School looks the same with banners everywhere exhorting the students to do well on the state test, now called the Test of Achievement and Proficiency, the TAP. Really, since the beginning of the school year, we've been preparing for the TAP. Since the beginning of the school year? Mm-hmm. You mean every day? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. With the reading and writing classes, they prepared us. We met during our lunch periods. We went out together after school. We plotted and we planned this course. Like, after we do our classwork, we'll have tap preparation. And sometimes we'll do it before we do our work or the whole day of our class, it'll, like, be for tap. Especially, I like what one teacher did. She made it also part of the grade. We did speed reading with the kids. Um, they wanted to get off of probation. The intense test preparation did not work. Again, 90% failed, and Austin remained on probation. I, uh, I felt sick to my stomach, and the other reading teachers were in tears. I was thinking it was going to improve, but it didn't. You know, it was devastating for the staff. I was sick. I was truly sick. I just could not believe that my scores did not go up. Sense of disappointment, because you were sitting in the class, and you would see the grades the kids would make, and it wasn't bad grades, and you knew they knew the material. But when the test come, they got scared, like Caitlin said, and their mind went blank. I expected us to be in the 20s. I really did think our kids were going to do it. But you took this so seriously that you were physically ill. Yeah. Well, the other teachers, I think, were as well. They were crying, desperately crying, the day that we found out about the scores. Mr. Slater was saying that he he was sick also, right? yeah. that he didn't want to go to a meeting. Or... And I didn't want to call that meeting at 2.30 when I called you all. And I told him I just didn't think the teachers believed what I was saying was true. But I wanted them to hear from me before they went home and heard this on the news. People no, say, what school you go to? No then they have to lie about what school they go to, knowing they go to Austin. Oh, I go to Steinmetz or something like that. Wait a minute. You're saying kids will actually lie? Mm-hmm. About what school they go to, just to say they don't go to Austin. 
because one, just one test and one score enables your child for the rest of his or her life. Now, our system will become less and less reliant on tests as, uh, as the, the gap closes and as confidence is restored that an A at eighth grade means an A at it against an eighth grade curriculum. Chicago is preparing a standardized curriculum which Paul Vallis hopes all local school councils will adopt. Four years ago, 70% of Chicago's students were failing basic skills tests. Today, 65% are failing. We have a long way to go, and, but I think we're on the right track. But school reform is on two tracks in Chicago, directly and fiercely competing with each other. Does their bitter competition threaten whatever educational progress Chicago has made? So what is your fear? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. People remember what this system was like when it was highly centralized. It wasn't that long ago. And uh, that's the great worry, I think, on the part of many of the other reformers. So you're saying there needs to be a, a constant tension? There needs to be the acknowledgement that we're partners in this effort. And that's what's missing, I think, is the central acknowledgement of that partnership. The struggle for control continues in Chicago. Mayor Daley and Paul Vallis want to restrict the power of local school councils, which are, of course, fighting back. Stay tuned. Seattle's a different story. A city united about the need for reform, the path to follow, and the leader to lead it. It's a story of remarkable accomplishments, sudden tragedy, and an unanswered question. What happens to reform when its leader is no longer there? In the spring of 1994, Seattle took stock of its schools and decided change was necessary. For one thing, about 25% of its students were dropping out. We can't continue to produce children who are underperforming in any global uh, reckoning. We have a school system that's not broken. It's nowhere near as good as it needs to be, but it's not broken. We're not going to get better grades on these test scores and kids more fluent in math and science by paying teachers more money or sitting there trying to pour more curriculum in it. We've got to redesign the thing. We've got to do it differently. We have a city that's not broken. Seattle is a very well-run city. We have a very supportive and organized business community. We have a very supportive press. And we have a highly effective union leadership. And I said, I don't know of a single urban system in the United States that has those five criteria present. Seattle's test scores were average. About half of its students passed basic skills tests in reading and math. But there was a significant gap in achievement between white students and students of color. We need a transformational leader. We don't need just a leader. We need a, a change agent. The teachers' union was in agreement. I, I felt we really needed to have somebody who, uh, who would come in with a fresh look and uh, who wouldn't come in uh, having said, well, we tried that before. Among the non-traditional candidates contacted was retired Major General John Stanford, then working in Georgia. His son, Scott, remembers. My reaction, just like everyone else's, was, superintendent of schools, what are you doing? And uh, he said, well, you know, you got to keep your options open. John Stanford had a 30-year career in the U.S. Army. After retiring in 1991 as a major general, he worked as county manager in Fulton County, Georgia. He and his wife liked what they saw in Seattle, and he became a candidate. The guy was amazing, you know, in, in his jet black, double-breasted suit. He stands up on the platform. He never strayed from Ramrod Strait for about two hours. In July of 1995, John Stanford was selected by the school board. I mean, this was a town that um, refused to have a Gulf War parade, okay? And so us hiring a four-star army general who had not a, you know, was a clean slate in terms of education, you know, he, you know, people, there were skeptics. He defied my stereotype of a general. In fact, I wasn't sure I wanted to work with him when he was first appointed because I didn't think I could work as a teammate with a general. The general quickly won over the skeptics. On the first day of school, he threw a back-to-school rally. And we have to get the entire community excited about educating our children. John Stanford's educational philosophy was simple and direct. Everything that we ask, we ask one question. What is in the best interest of our children? Stanford launched a community-wide reading offensive. It was hard for people to argue with that point of view. They knew that was right, and they knew that reading was the gateway to all other learning. So, of course, we had to start there. 
Support grew for the man the media dubbed the children's crusader. Seattle's children were particularly drawn to him. Robin Pascarella remembers walking in the park with John Stanford and meeting a group of second graders. One of the students saw John, yelled out his name, ran across, you know, in her bathing suit all wet, you know, wriggling, and there's John Stanford, there's John Stanford, our superintendent. And the next thing I knew, this little girl who was a second grader was running up to us, um, followed by this trail of other little children, all coming to see their superintendent. If you had walked into any classroom in the Seattle Public Schools and asked any child of any age, who's the superintendent? They had told you, John Stanford is the superintendent. I guarantee you. And of course, when they came up to him, he remembered them, he remembered his visit to their school, and then he said, have you been reading this summer? I'm excited about it here on my first day of school. <laughs> he was totally amazed at how well Seattle received him and received what he was trying to do and say. I mean, it always amazed him. He would call friends uh, in other parts of the country and say, you just won't believe this place. I am so honored to be your superintendent. I am so honored to serve your child and to serve all of the children here. We discovered early on that we both had the same kind of values and we had uh, a passion for, for educating uh, urban children. And so we really, uh, the relationship came together quickly. He empowered people in the lowest ranks he empowered the people on the street. He empowered everyday citizens that they can make a difference in children's lives. And he went into the schools and he talked about how wonderful our teachers are. When someone impressed John Stanford, he offered that person a job. I was in the elevator one day and the elevator opened and in walked John Stanford and he, and he said to me, hi, I'm John Stanford. And I said, hi, I'm Joseph Olszewski. <laughs> and we just started talking. And between the second floor and the fourth floor, we struck up a relationship. Joseph Olszewski was a successful investment banker. And uh, there was an, he didn't have a chief financial officer, and he knew that was really going to be a serious problem. So he asked me to join and, uh, and the district. And I said, yeah, that sounds great. Yes, a lot of new people uh, involved. Uh, Larry is new. Joseph has been here uh, about 60 days uh, today. And I've been the superintendent for 75 days. Almost immediately, Stanford began changing Seattle schools, always with an eye toward giving more power to school principals, to teachers, and to parents. Seattle had been divided about busing for desegregation for years, no more. It used to be you, you were assigned a school to go to. Now in Seattle, you can, we have 63 elementary schools. As a parent, you can go to any one of them you want. That's a major structural change. Or to say that another way, schools now are competing to attract students to their school. A second major change was in the way schools were funded. Instead of assuming that it costs the same amount to educate each child, Seattle recognized that children were different and their educational needs were different. So we created what is called the weighted student formula. So if you have a child in Seattle Public Schools, on the brow of that child is a dollar figure. We have $2,500 kids in our district and we have $25,000 kids in our district. And whatever amount it costs to educate a child, those dollars went to whatever school the parents chose. Schools were now competing for students. That's another radical change. The budget of my school now is a function of both the number of children and the type who elect to come, because they have a choice. But also, by the way, if they don't come, I don't get funded. So all of a sudden now, I need to recruit. I need to create an educational environment that attracts children. Teachers and their union leader, Roger Erskine, realized that their world was changing and they were ready to make concessions to be part of reform. What happened in the old unionism was, I mean, uh, the, the general motto was uh, management decides and the union grieves. Well, that didn't work. It didn't work for children in urban schools. We had a 221-page union contract. I mean, it is a picture book uh, document of decades of mistrust. It's the most onerous employee document I've ever seen in my life. And we said to him, Let, let's move it off. This is yesterday. Let's talk about tomorrow. And so what we are doing is we're changing the mix here. We're coming at this in a different way to, to get the focus off of the adults and onto the children. 
The time to say that is now. Stanford wanted individual schools to be able to hire their staffs, but in most teacher union agreements, seniority rules. That means veteran teachers have first choice of vacancies. And as a teacher um, and as a union member, that was a real powerful thing as, a, as, a, as an individual because I could say, I'm going to leave this school and I'm going to go and I'm going to choose my job based on my seniority. But it wasn't good for the schools. We moved to something that we think is better than seniority. Uh, we moved to uh, a qualifications-based hiring, um, which is really what our teachers have been asking for for a long time. With the decisions about who would be hired in the schools uh, made by teachers and principals. There's a leadership team of six teachers selected by their peers in each building, and that leadership team with the principal has the authority to hire and fire staff. So we're saying now, hey, listen, at the site level, you get to make the decisions. But guess what? I mean, that's where the responsibility is at, too. I mean, when everybody buys into something, you have a much more smoothly running operation. Is, is this a permanent change in Seattle? Can you imagine going back to the old way? Uh, nothing's permanent. I, I don't want to go back to the old, the old way. Um, but I, I, I would make no guess on any, on, I, I make no predictions as to what would happen. No one could have predicted that tragedy was around the corner. Two weeks ago at a Washington, D.C. conference, a weak and feverish Stanford checked himself into Walter Reed Hospital. D.C. doctors sent Stanford back home to Seattle for testing. Last night, he learned the news. He has leukemia. The important thing to note is this is a disease that tends to be rapidly progressive, but again, with intensive chemotherapy, uh, there is a great optimism that a remission can be achieved. Well, we're making the cranes for John Stanford because this one Japanese legend said you have to fold a thousand cranes so somebody can get well. His supporters created a get well fund. John Stanford asked that any money that was contributed be spent on books for school libraries. I, John Stanford, do solemnly affirm that I will love, cherish, and protect every child entrusted to my care. I affirm that I will endeavor to prepare all students to meet the highest... John Stanford lost his battle with cancer November 28, 1998. Officials at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center say Stanford died at 1.35 this morning from a recurrence of his leukemia and complications from the treatment. His Get Well Fund had raised over half a million dollars. That money was used, as he had wished, to buy books. I want to thank all of the people of Seattle and Washington State and across the country who contributed to make his dream come true. And the kids are going to be reading these books for the next decades to come. And it's a great day for Seattle. It's a great day for our kids. So uh, thank you, John Stanford. <clears throat> I might need to read that one. Do, who knows who John Stanford was? And can somebody tell? Belinda. The superintendent. That's right. What do you remember most about John Stanford? Nikki? He wanted us to read. In February 1999, Joseph Olszewski was chosen to succeed John Stanford. This is a special treat for us. Yeah, I'm going to read you a book. It's called A Blue Butterfly. The unanswered question is, will Stanford's reforms continue? You see me hesitate to answer, and that is because John's no longer here to push it. Olszewski is a good manager, but there was an element of Stanford's push, an element of the way he granted those principles independence and said, go do, you know, you, you do it. Um, that I, we, we, we're not yet sure Olszewski going to be that way. We lost a, a very dynamic leader, uh, but the district is not broken and was not broken. He surrounded himself with good people. And the person who has taken over in Joseph Oshesky is a very shining light. I think the changes we've created are um, very positive, very well um, accepted by our public. I think our parents are responding well. I think our student performance is um, going up. Scores are up only slightly, but the achievement gap between white students and students of color is closing. Perhaps of greater significance are the structural changes in the Seattle system. Parents have choice, 
Money goes to the school they choose, and a team of teachers and the principal at each school does the hiring without regard to seniority. Will it continue? Yes. Um, but that's one of the things I'm most confident about in terms of what we've been able to do together up to this point, is to really build these platforms or systems so that, so that it doesn't rely on a personality. What gets lost in a lot of this talk about uh, General John Stanford is is really the contribution that the community in Seattle made to what happened here. Seattle is a textbook case of what's possible when there's a charismatic leader whom people want to follow, a cooperative teachers union, and a focus on children's issues. Philadelphia offers nearly the opposite set of circumstances, a leader with a knack for offending people, a union more concerned about teacher prerogatives than student learning, and too often an inability to get beyond adult issues. David Hornbeck arrived in Philadelphia in August of 1994 and immediately began explaining his plan, which he called Children Achieving. He met with parents and representatives of community groups. His phrase, now is the time, Philadelphia is the place, and I would add a little more, and we are the change makers. Because people have to engage, people have to have hope, people have to buy in, people have to understand. He went to synagogues, mosques, and churches. Coming to the black church, uh, was very um, significant on his part. And many believe that the school district cannot change enough to help children learn, but it will, yes. All right. with your help. Yes. He met with principals. I would just like to say thanks. He did not meet with many of the city's 12,500 teachers. If he had, he'd have encountered skepticism. All we do is come in every day and, and do our job and try to teach these children, no matter what's happening up at the top. Teachers Union President Ted Kirsch was also skeptical. Here we go again. Another reformer, another new superintendent. I mean, I could relate the superintendents that we've had the last five or six. They all had a program. And as soon as they came, the successor came in, what's the first thing that happens? Do away with the old program. Now we have a new program. Children Achieving called for full-day kindergarten, more technology, and reorganizing the district into small clusters. Hornbeck also felt that Philadelphians had to change their attitude. The biggest single problem we face, in my view, is what the kids would refer to as an attitude problem. People who don't believe that kids can learn at high levels, particularly if they're African American or speak Spanish or have disabilities or so on. Hornbeck's honeymoon came quickly to a crashing end. Philadelphia school superintendent David Hornbeck wanted $120 million in the 95-96 budget to meet his so-called children achieving initiatives and make citywide improvements. But the district could only come up with $40 million. The budget was adopted today and calls for 64 cluster schools to begin phase one of children achieving next year. But the remaining 193 city schools will have to wait. Does this, in a sense, mean that we will be running two different systems within the district simultaneously? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Hornbeck refused to compromise his plan, but he made it clear that this was someone else's fault, not his. Because the state and the city have not stepped forward, um, we're going to have 190 schools, roughly, uh, that are not going to have the opportunity of uh, uh, early childhood and more books and more computers. The advocacy community was outraged. They said that they were further um, polarizing the school district uh, into have and have not schools, and he should not do that. I mean, he, he, if, if uh, there isn't enough money, um, people have to share the, the um, uh, hurt. The mayor, who had fought to bring Hornbeck to Philadelphia, defended him. He may be doing some controversial things, but, you know, if that ship's four-fifths underwater, it's time to come up with some innovative ways to, to either get it right or get us all out. To his supporters, Hornbeck is standing firm, but his detractors find him unbending and self-righteous. The only thing important to David Hornbeck is that his plan, as he sees it, be instituted. Period. It's easy for them to think that he's self-righteous because he is serious about changing things. And, and maybe his attitude, you know, his sort of um, preacher-like, messianic. He would put Machiavelli to shame. If you're going to call for David Hornbeck's ouster, tell me what he's done wrong. 
and tell me what you would do differently. Where's the balance? It's not all one-sided. Every time David Hornbeck talks to us, it's one-sided, it's one way, it's his way. David has great integrity, but he doesn't have that kind of charisma that Stanford had in, in, in Seattle that Ed Rendell has, because cities, you know, so much of it is perception. So much of it is convincing a very tired, cynical, suspicious electorate that we can do it. Probably in a popularity contest, I wouldn't win very many friends, but I didn't come here for that reason either. I came here for children achieving. And maybe David Hornbeck's fault is he has the wrong personality, which is no fault at all, but I think it counts for a lot. And it would be wonderful to be, uh, uh, both produce the goods and be charismatic, but I'm who I am. They want a cheerleader. They want a guy, I mean, reading about Stanford and Seattle, I want a guy who's out there, who's pounding away, who, who, who plays in front of the cameras and gives you that sense that you really love those kids. This is not about me personally. This is about a new agenda for America's children and for Philadelphia's children. Hornbeck's second year began smoothly with the opening of full-day kindergarten in most of the city's elementary schools. But we want to show how very, very, very right we are. With full-day kindergarten a reality, Hornbeck began to press for other parts of his children achieving plan. At the top of his list, accountability. There were six teachers dismissed for unsatisfactory performance last year out of 12,500. You know, it's silly. I mean, David Hornbeck is right. I mean, it's ridiculous not to be able to fire incompetent teachers. And in a school system of 12,000 teachers, you know, to, 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 to say only a handful should be fired every year is silly. I mean, it's absolutely silly. With the teachers union contract about to expire, Hornbeck pressed for change. We must build an accountability system for staff that for the first time links achievement by students, including those with whom we've historically failed, to real rewards, assistance for those who are having trouble, and penalties for persistent or dramatic failure. Union leaders felt that Hornbeck did not understand the realities of the classroom. If I'm a teacher and I set out to teach the kids long division and they all learn long division, did I do a good job? Yes. Now, what if they when, didn't? Okay. What if they didn't learn long division? Did I do a bad job? Let's <laughs> say, let's say you teach three classes, and in one class they they could do it, in one class they couldn't. Are you doing a good job or a bad job? Or how about a good job in one class and a bad job in the other? But you did the same job in both classes. What's wrong? Somehow, teachers have to be held accountable, not just teachers but teachers have to be included in this, for whether the students achieve. Uh, you're asking, can you evaluate a teacher on the performance of the students? And yes. And yes you, or no? No, you cannot. You cannot evaluate a teacher on right. the performance of his or her students? Right. Hornbeck also challenged another sacred cow. In Seattle, the union had, in effect, traded seniority for the right to be part of the hiring process. I think a team of teachers at the local school and their principal ought to get to decide who's going to teach at that school. That was not likely to happen in Philadelphia. I think that what Hornbeck wants is the total right to assign people wherever he thinks they should be assigned. And this union can't accept that. Does that strike you in, as the right way to run, run a school? That the administration has no control over who gets to come in and teach there? Yes. It does. Mm -hmm. If you were a principal, would that w work for you? Well, as long as I've been rated satisfactory, why would the principal object to me coming here? Do you think the principal ought to have some say in it? A chance to meet you and see if there's a, some kind of meshing? They might not like the way I comb my hair, John, and uh, you know, not choose me on for, that, uh, for that fact. I think that the membership would say seniority is a great union protection. We have, we have fought for that. That is ours. You cannot take it away. You know. Why would they do it? Because they care about kids? They don't, I don't think they care about kids. They care about their, their jobs. They care about their own protection. But that seniority rule is important to you. It's the sacred cow. Tension was mounting. The union called a general meeting of the membership. All those in favor of authorizing the executive board to conduct a strike, please rise as you give your answer to I.
Mayor Ed Rendell confronted the union. So what did you say to Ted Kirsch, Jack Steinberg? I said, look, guys, you know, you can't, you can't be so unbending and you can't make your agenda destroying David because you're not going to destroy David, at least as long as I'm here. What did they say? Six days before schools were to open, Hornbeck and the union agreed on a contract. Both sides claimed victory. We got a good contract. In effect, we won. This contract achieved real educational reform. For the first time, we have true accountability in our system. And we know that the superintendent's abhorrent accountability program and his punitive concept of punishment appears nowhere in this contract. He got a contract that wasn't what he would have wanted to have. It didn't make a lot of progress in the areas of accountability. You wanted to make a dent in the seniority rules. That's right. And you failed completely. And, and we more or less failed to do that. As David Hornbeck began his third year in the fall of 1996, he was determined not to back down on the issue of accountability. I'm here this afternoon because I have decided uh, to declare uh, Alney uh, and one other high school in the city a Keystone school. Keystoning allowed Hornbeck to transfer out three quarters of the teachers and bring in new people. Olney High was one of the city's lowest performing schools. This is an absolute fraud. It's been perpetrated on us by the administration. It's been perpetrated on us, not only on the students, but on the faculty also who have built their careers here. I, will, I am very proud to be an Olney teacher. And I will be very proud to be the first one out of here. Union President Kirsch met with all these teachers. This morning, I instructed our attorney to go to court to seek a temporary injunction to stop the process. That's number one. Number two, we have filed an unfair labor practice. That is a strategy that Federation leadership has used, is to object, expect the district to say, oh my goodness, uh, and, and then not go ahead. And life's too short to play the game that way. So you just go ahead? We go ahead. He does not respect the sanctity of a contract. You can't keep violating it and then blame the other person. That's what he's doing. What if you lose? What if an arbiter says you cannot keystone? Well, I, I think that's sad. Um, I, I really, again, I, I don't understand why the union um, keeps defending the status quo. Hornbeck lost. On July 9, 1997, the arbitrator threw out keystoning and criticized Hornbeck for not consulting with the union, as the contract requires. I would hope that the superintendent will finally come to realize that he has to adhere to not just the language of the contract, but the spirit, the intent. Leaving aside whether or not it complied with the legal requirements of the contract, the way he did it, uh, uh, was destined to create problems for himself. Fair to say you blew it? Um, from my perspective, not at all. Up to now, most of David Hornbeck's battles had been with the teachers' union. He was about to take on the state legislature and the governor over money. I went to him late one night and said, Mayor, if we continue down the same budget strategy that this system's been on for a long time, uh, this deal's going to be over in June, six months later. And you just need to know that. Uh, and uh, it was that evening, uh, 11.30 at night, uh, at his house when uh, he said, uh, all right, we're not going to cut, uh, and we're going to sue the state. Basically, they drew a line in the sand telling the state, give us money or we'll shut the schools. Either we are going to decimate the school system and by that I mean wiping out all of kindergarten and books and computers and everything of any pretense related to reform, um, or um, we won't be able to, um, to, to make the year and, and the school district will just shut down. Pennsylvania's governor, Tom Ridge, was not pleased. I mean, it was the only superintendent in my tenure as five years as governor out of 501 superintendents who budgeted, who was willing to put together a budget based on what he thought he should have rather than what the legislature was going to send him and what local government was going to uh, send him as well. And so 
to get exactly what he wanted when he wanted it, he threatened to th close the schools. Then in a speech, Hornbeck implied that the state's behavior was racist. Because everybody, every single body is God's somebody except too often children in Philadelphia. He made a speech to the National Council of Churches. Yeah, just insane. It is a speech that, in my judgment, needed to be made. That is the David Hornback messianic, if you don't believe in me, stuff that's crap. If you disagreed with him about money, he equated that to some sense of racism. We have not stood silently by. We have not simply taken it. Uh, we have actively filed lawsuits. Uh, we have spoken the truth. That's just an example of bad political skills. You don't say that stuff when the legislature is the very body that needs to increase our funding. And I don't think that that's, uh, again, an effective strategy or way to communicate your intense passion and desire for reform and change. It made him angry. <laughs> it made him more than angry. Uh, I think it got him extremely disturbed. And I think as a result, that's why you saw that um, that legislation that passed, um, that the governor and the legislature got to a point where they just didn't like what the superintendent was doing. Dwight Evans and most other state legislators approved a new law to allow the state to take over Philadelphia schools and fire David Hornbeck. It was a direct threat. And when someone is threatened, they're going to react. And that's exactly what the governor has done. And that's why the takeover legislation came about. When you look at that legislation, it's clearly, you're not going to tell us what to do. If you go and threaten us, we'll take you out. Typically, David Hornbeck did not back away. The alternative was to say, OK, we give up. The kids in Philadelphia are not going to be able to achieve. We need to keep these poor kids, these black kids, these Latino kids, these disabled kids under the staircase. And we really apologize for our temerity to think that every single one of these kids could be taken out from under the staircase. To Ted Kirsch, Hornbeck was continuing a pattern of alienating people. We were first. We were first to be alienated. Um, it's the city council. It's the state legislature. There are community groups. Uh, there are school communities. And I think it's unfortunate. Oh, the governor more important than anyone else because when you have a state surplus for money, a friendly governor could certainly help this school system. And I do regret the confrontation. I regret that the governor took it the way he did. I regret that Harrisburg hasn't yet ceased its mistreatment of Philadelphia children. Hornbeck filed other lawsuits against the state. All have been dismissed, but he's appealing. In the spring of 1999, as Hornbeck's fifth year drew to a close, the school board voted under pressure from Mayor Rendell to extend his contract for two years. Mr. Austin? Here. Yes. <laughs> Mr. LeVan? Yes. Dr. Mills? No. Yes. Uh, the motion passes. Motion passes. Uh... He's still not the most easy fellow to deal with because he believes so passionately in things that sometimes David sees compromise as inherently evil, and, and I don't. But you don't make the type of progress he's made across the board by alienating people and having two steps back for every one step forward. You, we wouldn't be where we are. We have fought the myth that our kids can't learn uh, and by that I mean poor kids and disabled kids and non-native English speakers and African-American kids. And we have made, I think, substantive, palpable, measurable evidence that that myth is a myth. Philadelphia students are doing better. Four years ago, 71% failed basic skills tests in math and reading. In 1999, 58% failed basic skills tests in math, reading, and science. I'm satisfied very much with where we are. Uh, it's not at all where we've got to be. What David has done has been nothing short of miraculous. I would be absolutely delighted if, uh, if other great city school systems like Chicago and Seattle and, and Boston and New York City, uh, we all arrive, because that would mean tens of thousands, hundreds of millions of children uh, 
uh, moving there. One of us has got to get there. None of these three cities, not Philadelphia, not Chicago, not Seattle, can declare victory, but all three seem to be making progress. There may never be a day when a city can say, it's over, we've won. But every city in America ought to be making the effort. To find out more about this program, visit us at PBS Online at the internet address on your screen. The Merrill Report, tale of three cities, the mayor, the minister, and the general.